extra handouts on the table. It's the easy to read versions of the article that um, I came up with. But let's uh, let's begin with a prayer. Am I coming through okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for gathering us. We ask that you send your Spirit down upon us today. We thank you for the gifts of our bodies. We thank you for our bodies becoming temples of the Holy Spirit during the sacrament of baptism. We ask that you guide our discussion today as we talk about keeping our bodies healthy and fit and reverencing our bodies when our time on this pilgrim earth is over. We give thanks and ask all this in Jesus' name, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, Amen. God forever and ever. Amen. 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 So, I thought I'd just take a few minutes to tell my story, just in case some of you who don't know my story will, will hear my story, so you know where I'm coming from as I talk today. Uh, most of you know I have a Boston accent. I grew up outside of Boston in Woburn, Massachusetts. It's about 12 miles west of Boston. That's actually the hometown of my dad. So I grew up in Woburn, and as a young boy, I went to St. Anthony's Church in North Woburn. And my dad, who had gone to St. Charles in Woburn, and had gone through Catholic schools, had never been an altar server. So for whatever reason, I don't know why, he had decided that I was going to be an altar server. I had no choice in the matter. And so, but he took it upon himself to teach me the Latin that I needed to know, because as you know, at that time in the 1950s as an altar server, you responded on behalf of the congregation in Latin. And so, as a first grader, I needed to learn Latin. So he taught me Latin. And I guess that was my first introduction in actually serving, if you will, at the altar. And, I, and the church was only about half a mile away. I could actually ride my bicycle down there. And many times I rode my bicycle down there to do uh, daily masses in addition to being there on weekend masses. So I lived there for the first 10 years. I, have, I come from a family of six children. I'm the second oldest. I have four sisters and one brother. And I was blessed because at St. Anthony's Church, when we went, when I wasn't an altar server, uh, facing the altar, we took up a whole role because there were six children, there was my mom and dad, and I was blessed that my mom's mom and dad lived across the street from us and always went to Mass. And so we took up the whole pew um, on a Sunday morning. When I was about 10 in fourth grade, my uh, parents moved from Woburn to Reading. And in Reading, um, I went to St. Agnes Catholic School starting in fifth grade. So I graduated from St. Agnes School. I was still an altar server. And then um, I had a choice of high schools. I actually went to Austin Prep, an Augustinian high school run by Augustinian monks. It was halfway the distance to the high school, so I don't know if that was part of my thought process to apply there, because I had to walk to the high school, but actually, uh, I really thrived there. I loved that all-male, it was an all-male school. It still exists today. Now it's co-ed, it's got a middle school, um, and it's still there. But I went to um, an all-male Augustinian Catholic high school. I graduated from there. I went to Merrimack College. Many of you know it's in North Ando. When I was at Merrimack College as a sophomore, I happened to meet my wife, Noreen, at a New Year's Eve party. And so um, that's how I met my wife, Noreen. And uh, we've been married 46, it'll be 47 years in September. So Nari and I were married, I graduated from Merrimack College. I started my career initially in banking in 1975, worked there for three years. Uh, when we were married in 1975, I had my first child in 1976. 
I have three children, uh, two daughters and my son, and then I have seven <coughs> grandchildren. So our time was in the community of Reading and St. Agnes. My wife and I were always involved in the church. We taught religious ed. I started actually teaching confirmation class when I was a sophomore in college because they couldn't get anyone to deal with the confirmation students who I think were sophomores at that time. So they figured I was young, so they asked me to do that. And I, I, that's how I started teaching confirmation classes and I taught basically religious ed over the, over the years. And then when Ari and I were married, uh, we were always engaged in the church. We took our family down to our family mass. We were always Eucharistic ministers. I was a lector, both my wife and I taught religious education. And one of the ministries we really enjoyed that we've done throughout the years, even when we came here, was engaged couples ministry. Working with engaged couples who were preparing for marriage. So we were raising our children um, in Reading and my career went from banking to insurance and in the insurance industry, I was in the training and development area. I worked for a couple of companies, Century Insurance Group out of Stevens Point, Wisconsin. I worked in their Northeast headquarters in Concord, Massachusetts, and I was sales training manager. Then I was sales training manager for American Mutual Insurance Company in Wakefield. Um, they went out of business at one point, so I became self-employed as a training consultant across New England and I work with banks and insurance companies. I taught uh, insurance licensing classes at Northeastern University. I taught financial planning classes at Bentley College and I was a training consultant working with insurance companies and insurance agencies. And then one day I came home, my office was out of my house but I was never there. There were three messages on my answering machine about a job in Keene, New Hampshire. I had never even been to Keene, New Hampshire, and I wasn't looking for a job. So I thought this was like, this is an article I'm writing this week, no coincidences. I said, this is a coincidence. Three different people, two of them I didn't even know, two headhunters, one I did know about a job in Keene, New Hampshire. So I came up here, interviewed for the job at Peerless Insurance Company. They, they kind of told me that thanks for coming up to interview for the job, but we're going to give it to someone from inside the company. I said, that's fine, I'm not looking for a job anyway. And so, but when Noreen came up, her family was from Western Massachusetts. And she loves the Berkshires. So she said to me, this reminds me of the Berkshires. If you get the job here, we're going to move here. So I said, well, no problem, they're not going to give me the job. Well, about a month later, I got another call. The person who we, gave the, we offered the job to was out in Indiana, insurance company in Indiana, doesn't want to come to New Hampshire. So the job is yours if you wanted it. I didn't want to move because I was highly involved in the church, as I just told you, St. Agnes. I knew everybody in town. My parents were around the corner. At that time, three of my other siblings actually lived in the town, and I had my own business. I was kind of fat, dumb, and happy. I did not want to go anywhere. So after talking to a lot of people considering it, and my wife kind of saying, we're going. <laughs> so here we end up. And so I've been blessed to be here. Uh, I started in 92. I worked with Kevin at Payless Insurance. They were open. They owned by the Dutch initially, Nationale and Netherlands, and they were bought by Liberty Mutual. And I had a great career traveling around the country, um, working with employees. I taught the employees our insurance contracts, personal lines and commercial lines. I taught independent agents. I had a group of trainers that I worked with around the country. And I had a great time. And while I was there, I decided I think I'll get a master's in education at Keene State, and the company was all for that. So I got a master's in Keene State when I was uh, 45. And then um, a friend of mine through the Society of Insurance Trainers and Educators said, uh, Ken, there's a great doctorate program in, uh, that I think you'd be interested in. And I was like, I don't want a doctorate. Why would I want to do that? But anyway, long story short, 
she talked me into it. So, uh, you know, I got uh, my doctorate in education from Nova Southeastern University while I was working and, and traveling all around. And so I was 50 when I got my doctorate. So I was sick and tired of studying. I got a master's at King State. I had a doctorate. I hate doing research and papers. Why I did this, I don't know. But I did. And so, you know, becoming a deacon was the last thing on my mind. Because I knew it was a four-year academic formation program. And the last thing I wanted to see was a textbook. So, because actually Father Jerry at one point in St. Margaret Mary said, you know, Ken, you might want to consider being a deacon when he was over there. I said, no, Father, I, I've done studying. I've got, you know, I'm just going to work. I'm going to retire in 10 years. I'm not going to do that. Well, what happened was in 2006, Noreen and I went on a pilgrimage with a group of people to Italy. And one day we were in Assisi, Italy. And Father Jason Jelbert, who's now in um, the cathedral, he was on the trip and he said, Ken, would you be the lector for today? I said, sure, I'll be the lector. So he said, you sit with Noreen, and when it's time to come up, do the read, come up, do the read, then sit down. I said, OK, I'll do that. So I did that in a CC, in a church. I got up, I did the reading, then I sat down next to Noreen. And I turned to her and said, I'm supposed to look into being a deacon. And she says to me, shh, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> so I don't know where that came from. I don't know what the reading was for that day. Today, by the way, we celebrate the Feast of Deacon uh, Ephraim. But, you know, it's just, it was an encounter that I had in Assisi. So I came back and talked to Monsignor Dan. And um, this was 2006. And he said, well, there's no formation program to be a deacon, so just keep praying about it. If anything happens to come along, I'll let you know. And so then, three years later, in 2009, they had the application process. And Monsignor Dan, he said, I think you, I really want to support you on this. So he did. I got in, as you know, went to St. Anselm's for four years, nights. Then we did weekend retreats during our formation. And it was a wonderful program. I was with 23 other men. We started out at 25. I think about 21 of us ended up being a day. But it was a great group of men and their wives for four years, St. Anselm. And so I was ordained in May 24, 2014, which was eight years ago. And I was blessed to be assigned here. And as you know, when I first came here, um, Father Steve Marcu, he wanted me to do everything. He said, you're going to do religious ed, you're going to do engaged couples, you're going to do da, 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 da. So he had me doing a lot of things, which was really beneficial to me because I learned an awful lot. And then when Father Allen came, he said to me, why are you doing all these things? And I said, that's a good question. <laughs> he said, you don't have to be doing all these things. I said, thank you. I'm going to try to retire. Because you know, when I retired from insurance when I was a day in 2014, I taught six years at the school. I retired from there two years ago. And he said, we'll have other people do some of these things. And I said, thank you, Father Allen, for doing that. But one of the things that I always do and we're going to talk about today is as a deacon, I'm, all, I'm involved a lot of time in baptisms, and, um, and I really enjoy baptisms. And I, and I you know, do the baptisms, and um, we're allowed to do baptism. And the other thing that I do quite often will be funeral services. Now, as a deacon, I can do a funeral service in a church outside, liturgy outside of the Eucharist. I can do a funeral service in the funeral home. And then I can do graveside services. And sometimes I'm even asked to go to a private home and to do that. So I think that's another uh, very blessed part of my activities as a deacon working with people who have lost loved ones. 
because obviously it is a very difficult time for them. Now, as I go around too and I bring communion to people um, in their homes, the question comes up, which led to my article in the bulletin about, you know, what are the Catholic teachings about our bodies? Which is a, which is, you know, is a great question. So I want to start with us thinking about a couple of facts. First of all, the Catholic view, our bodies are a gift to us from God. Now, if we start with that view, we look at things in a particular way, don't we? Our bodies are a gift to us from God. The old Baltimore Catechism years ago, you guys a lot have been there. Who made you? God made me, right? Our bodies are a gift to us from God. So a lot of times in popular culture today, it says, my body, I get to do with it whatever I want. No, that's not the Catholic belief. Our bodies are a gift to us from God. And I just mentioned baptism. What do we believe happens at baptism? The Holy Spirit enters into our bodies and we become temples of the Holy Spirit. So our soul, which is immortal that we know, is in our bodies. You can't see it, touch it, feel it. You don't know where it is in our bodies, but it resides in our bodies. And we become temples of the Holy Spirit. God resides in us in a very unique way at baptism. Father Allen preached the other day that when he saw the ordination, he said, I couldn't see the Holy Spirit come down on the transitional deacons as they became priests. But I knew it happened. Sometimes in baptisms, I shouldn't do this, but I kid around with the young kids that are there like two or three. They say, you watch when I do baptism. You watch because the Holy Spirit's going to come down when I pour the water. And you tell me after if you see it. So then I asked them after, did you see the Holy Spirit? And they were like, yeah, I saw the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and then I tell the adults, see, they can see what we can't. <laughs> so I kind of joke about that. But, you know, that's so important when we think about our bodies. A gift to us from God and the temple of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know as we age, we feel our aches and pains, and our bodies wear out. They're not immortal like our souls. And we try to take good care of our bodies. Some of us develop different illnesses and problems. I have had two shoulder operations. I've had a heart <coughs> ablation. And you know, I've had high blood pressure my whole life because it's in my family. So we take medicines. We try to keep our bodies in good shape as we can. But our body really houses the Holy Spirit. And then think about this. Whenever we go to Mass, we receive Jesus into our bodies as well. So, our bodies are a gift to us from God, temples of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to use the word sacred. So if we think about it that way, how do we take care of sacred things? You have many things blessed, whether it be a cross, the Bible, the rosary. And when they're done, do we just throw them in the trash? No. Usually the thing is we burn them or we bury them. Anything that has been blessed. We just don't throw them out. Because we know there's something special and unique about them. So if those are articles. How about our bodies? What can we think about 
uh, bodies. Take a sip of water here for a moment. I want to tell you another quick story that came to me the other day. When I was at Peel's Insurance Company, Kevin might remember this. I think it was 93 or 94, Kevin. Um, the insurance company decided we're going into a team training structure. Remember that, Kevin? Yeah, oh, yeah, I remember that. So there were different training departments in the company. I was insurance operations training, there was human resource training, there was claims training, there was bond training, there was all these training departments. So don't ask me how, but I got designated to lead the team training event for the whole company and to gather all of these trainers who didn't report to me and kind of, you know, work together, many of them were in positions higher than me, to coordinate all this stuff. And so the head of the, the company at the time, Roger Jean, said, I want you to lead this, Ken, and I want you to report to me in a week what the plan is. Okay? You know, it's nothing I didn't want to do, but okay. So, I'm thinking, I don't know anything about this topic. So literally, I went down to the bookstore, and I think I got 10 or 12 books on organizational development and team training. And I literally sat down for a week and sped read as much of those books as I could to put a pres presentation together for the executive uh, management team on the team training event. So the day comes, I'm as prepared as I can be. So I said, well, I'm going to be a little bit dramatic about this. I gathered up the 10 or 12 books. And I walk in, and of course, I'm intimidated because, you know, all of the executives are sitting around a table. So I line up all of the books on the table with the title so they could see it. Of course, none of them knew anything about team training. <laughs> so I just kind of asked them, well, open the question up, what are you thinking about when you think about team training? So they said, well, we're thinking about a half day event, bring everybody together, tell them you're going to operate as a team, everybody goes out and the world changes. And I said, well, you know, that's what these books talk about. And I said, guess what? All these books say, I hate to tell you, that doesn't work. <laughs> So I, they're looking at me like, well, what do they suggest? And then I said, they suggest these things, a year-long program coming together, da -da -ba 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 -ba, doing different things. Ba -ba. And I said, I didn't make this up. I said, I did my best in a week to research this topic for you, and I'm just sharing what I got out of these books. So actually, it worked. They agreed with me, and we went on to do that. Now, why am I telling you this story? Well. I'm not going to bring any books in and line them up today and say, these are the books about cremation and funerals. But if I were to do that, and I can't because my books are in disarray because we just moved the office over there and I have no idea what my books are, I would line up the Bible. What does the Bible say, right, about death? Then, what does our catechism say, right? What does canon law say? What do different church documents say? What does the Catholic Cemetery Association say? What does our tradition say, right? So all I'm saying to you is there are a lot of resources. How did this article come about? Well, I was sitting at Panera with Diane Farina and a couple of people. And I said, you know, I said, I've been going to a lot of places, and I said, I'm finding that people are being cremated and not buried. And I've heard a lot of priests talk about this, and I said, you know, I think I need to find out what the church teaching is on this. Because I, you know, I know a little bit. So, as you can see here, and I'll talk about this a little bit, you know, I looked at canon law, I looked in the Bible, I looked in the catechism, I went online, 
is a great resource that I've got down here. Um, www is down near the bottom. CCAW.org. That's the uh, Catholic Cemetery Association of Washington, D.C. I found that they had the most stuff out there. So I found there were a lot of good resources online. Because today, when I go to do a funeral or I go to a graveside service, there are different prayers if there is a body being buried or if it's cremains. So I kind of need to know that. And I'm finding that today, as you can see in the statistics here from the uh, National Federation of of funeral, National Funeral Directors Association, uh, at the top, more and more people are being cremated. Now why? Well, I think you know the answer. A lot of it is, number one, it costs less. It's less expensive to be cremated. Number two, many times they're not worried about a burial. And so it's a quick, easy, one and done, and I have sad to say a lot of times they have no services. It's just like, I hate to say this, but I, I will share this example. One of the funeral directors came to me once and said, um, a relative of a deceased person said to him, I know what your re job really is. He said, oh, what's that? He said, you're like a garbage man. Think about that for a minute. You are disposing of something. So I think that mentality might lead to cremation in many cases. It's quick, fast, easy, one and done, no prayers. And lots of times the funeral directors will tell you they've got the cremains and people won't come and pick them up. because they've got this disposal mentality. Now let's go back and think about what I said earlier. What is our view? Our bodies are a gift to us from God. They're tempers of the Holy Spirit. They're sacred. So when we look in the Bible, the Old Testament, we start, you know, with the Old Testament, and we know the Jewish customs about burying, about respect for the body. In the Jewish custom, and you can understand why because of sanitary laws and that, was to bury the body immediately. It could be disease, that could be infectious, and you know, you were unclean if you touched the dead body. We you know all of that. But there was a, some good reasons. But the idea was the body was sacred and it's anointed with oils, right? And it's put in a safe place. When I went to Jerusalem in 2010, you wanted to be, Jewish people want to be buried on the Mount of Olives that looks at Jerusalem, because they want to be closest to Jerusalem. During the resurrection of the dead, they figure out, well, Jerusalem is heaven on earth, I'm going to be as close as I can get. So, you know, they put their remains there. But the idea is that Jesus on the cross was taken down from the cross, was wrapped. So we know the Jewish customs. And then we know they were, Mary was going to anoint the bodies with oils. So the bodies were special. They are sacred, temples of the Holy Spirit. They're a gift to us from God. So we know that from both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now the other thing that comes up here is the teaching of Jesus, the resurrection of the body. Now we know St. Paul almost got killed because there were two groups, one believed in the resurrection, one did not, and they were going to kill him. And so, you know, they had to... So, the resurrection of the body is a teaching of Jesus. Now, if you were with us today at Mass, 
we pray the luminous mysteries. The fourth luminous mystery is the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John went up Mount Tabor. Jesus is transfigured. Moses is Elijah is there. And he's transfigured to show Peter, James, and John the future. To help them understand the crucifixion that's about to happen that he's explaining to them on the way down after the fact. But to really enlighten them about the resurrection of the body. And how when our pilgrim journey on this earth is finished. So the resurrection of the body is also a foundational concept concerning our Catholic beliefs on how we take care of the body of a deceased person. So we believe in the resurrection of the body. And we know our resurrected body is going to look differently. We know that because of the fact when Jesus appeared after rising from the dead, he was not recognized. Mary Magdalene thought he was a gardener. When Jesus was on the shore, the Sea of Galilee, the fishermen came in. It is the Lord, but they didn't really recognize him. So our resurrected bodies are going to look a little differently. <coughs> There's a movie out that I show over, over at the county jail, Heaven is for Real. And it's a story about a little boy who says he went to heaven during his operation where he almost died. And he said, and his father, he, he tells stories about, he was, telling, he was only a four-year-old boy. He started telling stories to his dad about people he met every once in a while. And he said, I met so-and-so, and so once he said, I met your grandfather. And so he said, you did? You met Pop? He said, yeah, I met Pop. He told me he was grandfather. So his father ran and got the picture of Pop when he was a senior. And he says, no, that's not Pop. So then he found a picture of Pop when he was like 21 years old. He said, yeah, that's Pop. And the little boy said, yeah, in heaven, everybody's young. And they don't wear glasses. <laughs> I have hearing aids too, probably they don't have hearing aids. <laughs> so our resurrected bodies are going to be perfect. So we believe in the resurrection of the, of the body. And so at some point, our souls are among, our souls are reunited with us. We believe in the resurrection of the dead in the final resurrection. Now, one of the things that complicates all of that is people ask the question, well, how does that happen and when does that happen? And I'm not too sure because I'll introduce you to the idea is that when we die, we're in a realm that is not time bounded. All we know is a time-bounded realm, right? That's all we know. But our souls are immortal, and, you know, God and all the angels and saints live in a zone that is not time-bounded. And so we pray for those who are, have died. We hope that they're in heaven. We pray for those who died that they're making their way there. But they're in a realm that I don't think we can really understand because it's not time-bounded. But Jesus taught us. And he told us what our destiny, where it is. And he opened the gates of heaven for us. <clears throat> and the resurrection of the dead is, a, is an important concept. So, with that in mind, we want to place the deceased body in a place that is protective, that shows dignity and respect. And that maybe we can even go and visit that place. We know that person really isn't there, but their body is there.
And so it's a unique place for us to go and to visit. Now, my wife Noreen heard Bishop Peter once give a half hour talk on why we should be buried in a Catholic cemetery. I don't know all the details, but Catholic cemeteries are blessed. They're blessed. And when I go and I bury people in a public cemetery, I bless that spot with holy water. I'm not telling you where to be buried. I have a plot at St. Joseph, but that's my own personal preference. But there are many, many concepts, and a lot of this stuff can be online with the Catholic uh, Cemetery Association. But the idea is, when someone passes, whether you've got a choice, right? We're going to be cremated, or is it going to be full body? Now, one of the choices, actually, too, if you're going to have a funeral mass, which many people do not have, which, which is recommended, if you're going to have a funeral mass, you can have the body at the funeral mass. And then after the funeral mass is over, you can have it cremated. It costs less. And again, with cemetery plots, it's more expensive to have a cemetery plot, obviously, for a full body versus cremains. And then, you know, Neil and I were talking about some churches are setting up special places on the church grounds where you can house the cremains in their sacred spaces. So money comes into play in a way. Now, as you see here in my article, up to like in the 1950s and 60s, the church didn't want people to be cremated. But then they loosened that requirement. And when you read canon law, in my opinion, it's very vague. Because all it really says is, you can be cremated as long as you don't deny the resurrection. I'm not sure really what that means. But if you do it just because you think there's no resurrection of the dead, you're doing it for the wrong reason, is what canon law says. Yeah, yes. yeah that, was, that was out of the Age of Enlightenment in France, when people were saying, well, I don't believe in the resurrection, so I'm going to get cremated. That's when that all started. And that's right. when the church right. said, no, no, that's So no you can be cremated today. And it's just that line that's in there. So it's, it's a belief statement. It's a belief statement. All right. So there's options. But again, as you read the article, the belief is bury the cremains of the body. Now, one thing that jumped out at me personally when I read this is we're very respectful of a dead body. We would not allow our, a dead body to sit in our living rooms for six months or a year on the coffee table. <laughs> and you know, this is kind of gross, but we wouldn't hang a person's toe around our neck. Because what's happening today is people are being cremated and their remains are on the coffee table. Mm. Or in a closet shelf, or somewhere. And some people have been in their homes where they've set up a little area with a candle and everything. But that's really not where that cremains should be. And it's very popular today to sell a necklace to put the cremains in your mind. And I've heard all kinds of stories about what people do with the ashes. A Catholic gentleman once told me, I said, what happened to so-and-so? Well, he said, oh, I got to tell you. This guy was a trucker. We took his ashes, and we went along this truck route, and we threw the ashes out the window all along this truck route. I said, you didn't. I said, yeah. You know, so I tried to explain to him about dignity and respect. 
resurrection of the dead, and the Catholic belief of burying cremains or the body. But you know, it's throughout history people have dispersed ashes in backyards, on mountaintops, and so on and, and so forth. One of the interesting things is burial at sea is permitted under certain circumstances. But it just comes back, I guess, to my original point that I made, which is, do we believe that our bodies are a gift to us from God? And if so, how do we handle that gift? I don't know if God's going to ask me when I see him at the end how I treated my body. But it's not mine. It's his. He gave it to me. Some of us may not like our bodies, but you know, it's all good. None of us are perfect. We don't have a glorified, <laughs> resurrected body on this earth. We will when we get to heaven. But that's a gift to us from God. Our bodies house the Holy Spirit. When we receive Holy Communion, Jesus is within our bodies. Our bodies are sacred. And so I think that's the important message that I tried to share in this article. And so I put out extra articles. If anyone wants to copy them or take them for, for other people. And you know, when I wrote this article, I said to my wife, first I said to her, I said, Noreen, I don't think people are going to be too happy with me about this article. She says, yeah, I don't think so either. I said, well, you know, it's not, I didn't make this stuff up. It's just our beliefs, and you know, but I believe in it. I believe my body is a gift from God and it's sacred. And I believe that I needed to write this article to help people be thinking about what are we doing when someone dies. Just like that team training event. Do we just make something up? Or do we step back and we think about what's the right thing to do? What's the right thing to do? What does the Bible say? What does canon law say? What did Jesus talk about? So I think that's important because in today's society, I hate to say it, there's too many people who look upon that funeral director as the garbage man. He's not the garbage man. He's helping us to set that body aside in a sacred place because that body is due respect and it is due honor. So, that's where I am. That's what I wanted to share with you. That's why um, I wrote the article. And I had one gentleman come up after the uh, 9.30 Mass on Sundays said to me, thank you for writing that article. He said, I didn't know any of this stuff. And I said, well, I was just trying to be educational and informative. And I will share with you, I was really surprised. I was down in Gloucester with my two kids from Texas Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I got a text um, asking me to come if Father Darby couldn't be here to talk about this article. And I said, really? People want to talk about this? <laughs> so they said, yeah, and they may have some questions. And I said, I'd be happy to. I said, I'm not the expert on it. This is what I've experienced as a deacon. This is what I've found out, and this is what I want to share. So here I am. Let's open it up for questions or comments. Uh, Deacon, I totally agree with all of this. In here. I, um, I, I've just had several situations within my family when I try to say, you need to bury the body, don't scatter the ashes in the ocean, mm -hmm. and with my own mother 
We did bury most of her, but they scooped out part of her, and I'm freaking out, like you said. Is there a toe there? Is there a finger there? And my son-in-law that just died, he's mm -hmm. cremated. My daughter's driving him back and moving to New Hampshire, and she's giving his cremains to his mother. They are not religious. We have an aunt that wants to be buried half in New Hampshire, half in Alabama. <laughs> And they're not Catholic, and they don't have the same beliefs. Can, honestly, can you give me any words of comfort yes. for my agony over yes. these situations? I, yes, because this is what I've come to, and I hope it's a word of comfort to you. Nothing is impossible for God. God knows what's on our hearts. And so we just have to offer it up to him and pray. But, you know, nothing's impossible for God. Can my friend John, whose ashes were distributed all along this truck route, have a resurrected body? I believe that nothing's impossible for God. Mm -hmm. I don't think his remains were treated respectfully, but I don't think anything's impossible for God, and I believe John will have a resurrected body. So that's my comfort that all I can have an answer to. Thank you. Anyone else? No. I think a lot of people just don't know, Deacon. And yes. I don't think they do it, a lot of them, intentionally. They just don't know. So. And I hate to say this, but some of the funeral directors are making money on selling all of these I things. Was just because they're in a business. And I understand business, I understand money making. What else? I was gonna say the same thing. Um, when you go to the funeral home, they give you all these pamphlets and you can get, you can get jewelry and you can get paperweights and you can have all these things. Well, eventually also these necklaces and paperweights are going to end up in a yard sale. Because it's oh, not we don't know be, where. <laughs> we don't know where, but it's not going to be kept necessarily in a family because no. after a generation or two, nobody knows. They forget. Or you don't even know that the paperweight has yeah. ashes because exactly. it doesn't look like that. So, so and you know, it's, if someone is buried, many times relatives have no idea where the person is buried yeah. in that. Like you say, time passes, generations, people yeah. move out of the air, but they still were buried. Yeah. And it's a respectful place because you're right, through the passage of time, people change, people forget. Some, some of us, you know, are not Catholic. And I, you, know, you know, I grieve with a lot of grandparents because I'm one of them who's who has a grandchild that's not baptized. Mm -hmm. yep. <clears throat> I also Nothing's impossible for God. I pray about it. And you know, there are certain things outside of our control. I like having a marker. I go and visit my grandparents pretty frequently. We go to cemeteries and we go and we clean them up or say a prayer, leave a little something. It's a place to go, to, to place connect, and to, honor. Yeah. and to honor. I mean, I go to my mom's probably every month anyway, when I'm driving by. Or it's a special place to honor them. Yeah. You're exactly right. I mean, I know they're in heaven, right. but we hope. <laughs> right. We hope and pray. But they're making their way there. <laughs> but we, uh, it's a place to go where yes. the final is. Right. Yeah. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, uh, you mentioned sacred spaces in a Catholic cemetery, and I'm sure many holy people were have been buried in Catholic cemeteries. <laughs> um, is it wrong to think that their remains are like relics of sorts, and this is a really holy place to be? I mean, I don't know. No, I you know because it's it's many years after the fact that sometimes, you know, as part of the canonization yeah, process, yes, yes. you know, they they open up graves to see, you know, if, has there been any uh, decay of the body, yeah. and, you know, 
up comes a, the smell of fresh flowers and there's no decay. Yeah. So that is, that, you're exactly right. You know, that could be an example, you know, of a, of a relic. Yeah, I'm sure, like, when we drive by St. Joseph's all the time, oh, yeah. that, that there's many, many holy remains, or remains of holy people in that cemetery. Well, you know, it's interesting because I just did a um, memorial service this past Sunday at 9 o'clock for the fire department, and we read the names of all those firemen that had gone forward, and I talked about, you know, why we have Memorial Day, why we have cemeteries, and that everything in life matters. What they did and what we did, and we're building on their efforts, and so they are still good role models for us, and we remember them, and we can go back to a space and we remember them, because it's dedicated to them, and we can think about all of the good things and how they loved us in this life. And one of the things I say during funeral services, I say, so-and-so all loved you, right? They say, yeah. I say, do you think they have stopped? No, they still love us. They're just in a different realm. And we still love them. And we can still communicate to them. And they can communicate to us as well. And so that's why we pray to them and why we pray for them. We have a special place to go where they, and we say the prayers, they're here resting in peace. Their bodies here, we don't really know where their soul is, per se. But, you know, their, the body that they had during life is there. It may have completely decayed. It's maybe just bones. Who knows? But they're there in a very special way, maybe from a relic perspective. I like that. What else? Uh, two things. One is genealogists of the future are going to be really upset if there's no place to go to get the information on somebody who died. And the second thing is, um, there's a monastery in Berryville, Maryland, Virginia, whatever, and they allow green burial, where the person hasn't had any embalming, yeah. and there's nothing plastic or anything in the, in the casket. The, the casket was made out of wicker, mm -hmm. and they bury there, and the, the monks are very good, and you don't have to be Catholic to be buried there. Because there's a lot of people now who are looking at the chemicals of, of embalming. Yes, I know. Yeah. So there's a lot of concern about that. Yeah, and that you could you could have a green burial, and it could still be very respectful and holy and everything. Well, and again, you hit the key: dignity and respect. I think things change over time, obviously, but we want to change. We want to honor that body with dignity and respect. Now, is that the other thing? I got an article come out, not this week, but next week, about all the things that I've done in the last month. We had the mass at the cemetery. I did a memorial service. Uh, I've, done a, I've been doing a lot of uh, grave sites. And we just want to honor the people who went before us. And that's why it's good for us to have these different services and to remember people and to put the flags out there on the cemeteries and clean the cemeteries up and you know have the cemeteries as a peaceful and uh, restful place uh, as it as it can possibly be. Yeah. I have one interesting thing. Our son died almost 12 years ago. Yeah, I remember. And I didn't know it until time, but the, the mortician will get fingerprints from the deceased. And they gave us a brochure that showed <coughs> you get a pendant that from that fingerprint, they will put the same fingerprint on either gold or silver or whatever and put it on a necklace. On the first Mother's Day after our son died, our other children got together and gave one of those to my nice. wife. I bet she's got it on now. Nice. And she wears it all the time. But the body was treated the with body respect. Right. was separate from that. Very nice. Yes? You talk about the regulations about spreading the ashes. I don't think that's necessarily to make things easier for God at the resurrection. Because Mother Nature, how about a flood? Yeah. You know, the remains are spread to the four corners of the earth. And, but one other thing that I don't think you mentioned was 
we tend to think the soul is the more important thing. But you cannot receive a sacrament without a body. You know, body and soul are both gifts to us from God, and they're reunited. That's the resurrection of the dead. You're exactly right. They come back together. Same person. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So the body is important. It's not something to be discarded. It's going to be reunited with the soul. Anything else? Yes, Ben. Uh, you know how, uh, like, you talk about how, like, body is, like, you know, we got to, like, really take care of it? Like, do you think, like, you know, like, I know, like, we sometimes, like, you know, well, sometimes not, like, take care of it by, like, you know, eating bad or, like, you know, like, some days we'll, like, get, like, you know, now you have, like, people get tattoos. Like, what are your thoughts on, like, you know, you know, it's interesting. One, first, a couple of things you mentioned. None of us are perfect, Ben. None of us take care of our bodies in a perfect way. None of us eat completely healthy. None of us exercise completely the way we should. None of us do whatever we're supposed to do. Because guess what? We're all sinners, Ben. And none of us are perfect. And so that's what we rely on God. You know, the issue about the tattoos, you go back and forth on that. Some people say in Leviticus it's prevented, but it's kind of a vague statement in Leviticus. But, you know, people have different ideas on that. Some people will say, if your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's already perfect. You don't need to embellish it with tattoos. But... Um, I'm not going to get into that discussion on that. There's different perspectives. And I think, too, depending upon your cultural perspective, how you grew up in tattoos and stuff versus today. Uh, but that's just a question. You know, if, if our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, how, how do we, while we are alive, how do we try to treat it? Try to treat it with dignity. Now, lots of people, you know, on the tattoo things will get crosses, uh, rosaries, uh, you know. For a while there, over the county jail, I haven't done it recently, but for a while, I would ask different people who had various, tell me about, it. they always had stories. It was a memory of a loved one, of an event. So people get them for particular reasons. And I guess we respect that, that's all. But we're not perfect, Ben. <laughs> None of us perfect health-wise, height, weight, whatever. None of us are perfect. None of, you know, we try to work with our doctors. Doctors aren't perfect. Medicines aren't perfect. But we do the best work. We're in an imperfect world. And we're all sinners and we just go with it, that's all. Anything else? How about with regards to various illnesses, injuries? A leg is amputated, a cancerous kidney is removed. What, what are we supposed to be doing there? Because as far as I know, the hospital just chucks it. You know, I don't have any idea, Neil. Did you repeat that? I didn't hear. The question is like if a body part is amputated, you know, what do we do with that body part? I have no idea. I've never had that question asked, and I've never run across it. So, you know, how, you know, if a body part, well, you know, in war, what happened to them? Yeah. You know, in the field, you were, you know. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good, I would try to think it would treat with dignity and respect somehow. I just wanted to say that I've noticed over the years from when I was young to now that a lot of people are foregoing funerals and wakes yeah. and going right into celebrations of life and because it's easier. But I think you miss some of the grieving process a little bit because I would have to go, I remember my grandparents and relatives and it was uncomfortable and it was grueling and it was hard to stand there for two or three hours in the afternoon and then stand there again that evening to receive people. But it also helped with a lot of internal things 
that you wouldn't otherwise get just going to a party. Yeah, you're exactly Plus right. I think we all agree that people are foregoing wakes, and wakes are important yeah. for those left behind, the grieving process, they're foregoing funerals. They have a celebration of life when you show up. It's just a room. There's no <laughs> remains of anything there. And so, you know, one of the things that's said in there is it's, it's, it's important maybe to have the body around for a little bit just to be able to say goodbye. And so that's one of the things I think I read in the, uh, the Catholic Cemetery Association document. It helps us with the grieving, the mental process of letting go. Yes. Ellen and I went to pick out our cemetery stone. We haven't quite got there yet, but the woman there was like trying to talk us out of body burials. She was yeah. like, that's disgusting. <laughs> I just, all I say is make sure I'm dead when you bury me. That's my <laughs> Me too. Uh, that's <laughs> I like okay. being alive. <laughs> so it's 10 o'clock. Let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us here today. Thank you for all of the good questions that we had about funerals and wakes and respect of our bodies. We believe in what Jesus taught us. We believe in the resurrection of dead and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my